Now on the APEC VIP hotline, cutting edge training for the serious athlete, apecgo.com. Joining us now from the Fort Worth Star Telegram, DFWOT, the author of the Big Mac blog, Mac Engel. How you doing, sir? I'm good, Brian. How was your weekend? Well, it was great. Uh, not as good as yours, though, it doesn't sound like. I mean, I'd like to talk about the Cowboys and the BCS and all that other stuff, but I want to get to the real important stuff first. You just finished talking to Jane Fonda? Yes, I did. Are you uh, serious? I had trying, uh, yeah, I had been trying to land this interview for the last couple of weeks, and uh, she is right now making the rounds. She has a new workout DVD out. This is a, a yoga DVD, and her publicist made her available, and I took it. Uh, thinking, well, you don't get a chance to interview a Hollywood icon who is now in her 70s and still incredibly popular and going strong. So, yeah, I just cut off the phone with her a little while ago, and uh, I think I could have been a phone book and she wouldn't have cared. <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, it was an interesting interview. I, I you know I did the obligatory questions about her DVD, and then we started to talk about a little bit about her career in Hollywood and and. Nine to five and and on Golden Pond and stuff like that. So it was a that was a fun interview. Uh, well, what was the most interesting thing that you got to talk to her about? Um, I, there's a couple different things that I thought was kind of. First of all, the thing that I think that I, I wanted to ask her about was how she fell into the. And, and you're of an age that you would remember this. How she fell into the leg warmer craze. <laughs> and um, and I I didn't want to do it disrespectfully because. When people say leg warmers, they immediately identify with Jane Fonda wearing leg warmers right. in those 1980s circa video uh, workout DVD, workout cassettes. And I said, why did you do it? And her answer was she was about, she had grown up as a ballerina. She, she had done ballet forever, mm-hmm. which is pretty strenuous exercise. And she said, that's how ballerinas keep their legs warm is by wearing leg warmers. So that's why she warm. And she had no idea that she had stumbled upon and created this in total, massive, eternal fashion <laughs> statement that would endure for 30 years. So when I, I said, and in this new video, the, the new DVD, uh, she's in it, and she's wearing a headband, but she's not wearing, she's wearing traditional yoga clothes, and I said, why didn't you wear the leg warmers? And she had asked her fans, should I wear the leg warmers? And the fans' response was, no, don't go retro, you know, just, you know, keep that back in the 80s, but... That's why she did it. She did it because she was a ballerina, and that was the only way she knew how to keep her legs warm was by just wearing leg warmers. And now all of a sudden we have a total Jane Fonda leg warmer series. That's awesome. That's very cool. I'm glad she didn't hang up on you, too. No, but it was funny. At the very beginning of the interview, she said, Hi, Mark. Nothing like ex- nothing like respect. I like that. That's exactly right. And I told her, I said, actually, it's Mac. It's M A C. I she couldn't have cared less. She yeah. may as well have said, okay, Bill, I don't care. <laughs> Ask your stupid questions so I can hang up the phone. She can. But she was, I was she's very nice. She's very polite, and it's not every day you get a chance to you know interview people like that. So it was it was fun. That's awesome. Please, dear God, let this interview end in three minutes, right? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yep. okay. It's kind of like the game last night. Please, dear God, let this thing end in about three minutes. That was amazing. That game. Went, that game held our attention for 59 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> what did you make of that thing last night? Uh, the Eagles are just bad. The Eagles are just in one of those seasons. Like Even when the Cowboys were down, even when the Cowboys took the lead and with about five minutes to go, I, I tweeted it. I, I really, You could just feel, I thought Nick Foles was going to throw an interception. Instead, Bryce Brown fumbled the ball and was picked up by Morris Claiborne and returned for the touchdown. But you could just feel that that's the way the season has gone for the Eagles. It's not like that team lacks talent. You know, they've got players, and, and whoever coaches that team next year is going to have players to, to work with because we know it's not going to be Andy Reid. And I thought it was just another case of the Cowboys barely beating a bad team, whether it's Tampa Bay, whether it's the Cleveland Browns, whether it's the Philadelphia Eagles now twice. They, they find ways to beat the really, really bad teams and then come up short against the good ones. And if you look at the remaining schedule, they've got four games left, theoretically all winnable, and yet, given the way the season's gone, I just don't know if we saw anything last night that says, "Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna go three and one." Now they might, or they're gonna go four and zero. Oh. No, they could. I can't remember. I mean, no. it's been. I think it's been since two thousand and seven 
maybe two. I think it's been since 2007. This team won four in a row. In, in December, not a chance. Oh no, yeah, not yeah. a chance. I mean, and that's just it. You've got a Bengals team that is 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 talented but kind of unpredictable. You've got a Steelers team that's the Steelers. I don't care anybody tells you they play physical football and they play smart. That's gonna that's tough. The Saints are better than their record, even though their defense is bad. And the Redskins, yeah, they already beat you once. Even so, you wouldn't be surprised if Dallas went in there on the the regular season finale, especially if there's something at stake. But the way the way this is shaping up, and the way the fact that the Cowboys already have lost games against the Bears and against the Seahawks, they've lost that head to head. So they're going to need Seattle to fall apart, which could happen. And and then they're going to need that, and then they're going to need everything to go right here. So their best chance. It's for some reason the Giants fall apart and they can somehow win this division. There's still a chance that there is, and you have to hold you have to hold on to that because a lot of teams in the league, you know, San Diego has no chance right yeah. now, Oakland, Cleveland, et cetera. So at this point, this is what you've got to hold on to, but the reality part of it, like you and I have talked about, I just don't know enough has changed really to sit there and say, Oh yeah, now they've got it going. It to me it just looks like more of the same, with the exception of two things. DeMarco Murray's back. That helps a lot. And Des Bryant looks like he's got his stuff together. Did, so, you think he's finally figured it all out? I don't know. I mean, it's not like you could ever say whenever you watched him play, and I don't know if you ever saw him play in high school. I didn't. No. But you can never accuse that guy of taking it down off. You can never accuse him of not wanting it. I mean, you could almost accuse him of wanting it too, too much. Mm-hmm. And when you watch him play, he plays with a ferocity and intensity that you're like, holy cow. I mean, look at the way he ran over guys. Oh, he's a monster. Total monster. Total monster. If, if he's fearless about going over the middle, he'll run. If, if he just plays smarter, they've got something. And it does look like he's played a little bit smarter the last few weeks, and Tony Romo has trusted him a little bit more to be where he needs to be. But with Dez, until he does it really over, I mean, it's just been three or four weeks, and he's been great. He's been great. But you, you still got that feeling of, oh, you're still holding your breath. But for the time being, you know, you got to take it. You take it and enjoy it. Uh, yeah. and, and DeMarco Murray, you mentioned him, but uh, you know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe a great back does make a really bad offensive line look better. I mean, you know, he still averaged less than four yards a carry last night, but he looked so explosive compared to the guys that normally are standing back there. Uh, I mean, it was just like he's head and shoulders above anybody else on the Cowboys roster at running back. I think he is. I think it's two things. One, the Eagles' run defense is pretty bad. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they you, you, in this game, in these six games, five or six games that DeMarco Murray was out with the foot injury, the Cowboys had one game where they ran for more than 100 yards, and that was against Philly when Murray was obviously out. Now Murray's back. They're going against that same bad defense, and Murray gashed him pretty good. Now, he had one run, the very, very last run that he had was minus 11 yards. So he almost he almost had 100 yards, but he did. He, did. he made everybody look better. And I, I, at this point, you have to take it. It's, it's not like that offensive line is going to get that much better. I still think Tyron Smith can play. The rest of them, oh. God. Doug Free it, last it, night against Brandon Graham. Brandon Graham, I mean, really? And, and the thing that's so disappointing about Doug, you got to remember a couple of years ago, Doug Free really looked good. Yeah. And you're like, they, they've got something there, potentially as a left tackle. Well, now he's at the right side where it's a little bit easier. And he, I think the thing that's most troubling, most troubling for him, one, penalties, which means he's not good enough. He's the most penalized offensive lineman in the NFL. He is routinely getting knocked back. Yeah. It's like he's not strong enough. And then the other part is, his technique looks so poor that whoever he's lining up against is always getting the edge on him, which means Romo has got to step up on nearly every pass play. Now, if you notice in the second half, Free was better. He really was better. But if he can't sustain it, then who the hell cares? And the problem is if you're the Cowboys, you're looking at a plus $10 million cap hit on Doug Free if they were to cut him. So they may do it. They may have to. But it's more one of those things like, God, that's another guy you gave you money whipped, and now he's doing nothing for you. And that makes the fact that Romo only threw five incompletions last night even more impressive. More impressive, and I think it's also a stinging indictment on that Eagles defense. Well, yeah. I mean, they, they, <laughs> the Eagles have tried everything. They fired the coordinator, Castillo. They put him in with Todd Bowles. Todd is 
all but killed his chance of ever being a defensive coordinator again with this with with the Eagles' defensive performance this season. I mean, you're talking about a bad team versus another bad team, and a bad team won, or an average yeah. team won, and the bad team lost. So, I think if you're the Cowboys, you're like, yeah, great, we're six and six. You got four games left, and you know it's still there for you theoretically, but you need a little bit of help. And you need to do something you haven't done in three plus seasons, which is to go on a real winning streak. Yeah, good luck with that. All right, I got to ask you about the BCS. Boy, that Orange Bowl matchup just sends chills up and down my spine, man. Northern Illinois and Florida State. If I was the Orange Bowl, I'd sue the BCS. I, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think you put it on your Facebook post last night about <laughs> asking about that game. I'm like, I'm fine with it. You know, I like to see an underdog play. I, I like to see the underdogs get a chance in a neutral site. So I was like, yeah, okay. That one's a joke, though. I agree. Um, let's see. Seven and five Wisconsin is in the Rose Bowl. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Um, How about Louisville Georgia and versus, Florida? Oh, yeah. They were go to the Louisville one. Louisville versus Florida and the Sugar Bowl. That's an exciting game. I mean, you know, and you know, the Sugar's sitting there talking about Oklahoma coming to town, and all of a sudden they got Louisville. <laughs> Texas A and M, but what we got? Texas A and M versus Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl. Yeah, that's which which good. the Cotton Bowl is sitting there thinking, saying, "Man, what kind of heaven have we just opened up?" You know. Yep, that that's a good one. LSU versus Clemson yep. in the Chick Fil A Bowl. That one should be pretty good. But I got to tell you, I, and I'm writing, I'm just now working on this. Um, I got to tell you, Brian, I I think the biggest problem, the bowl games are what they are. There's too many people getting rich from them. It's too ingrained. You're not going to necess- You may lose a couple, but you're not going to undo it. But I really think if you want to keep the bowl system intact, you flip it. You put it in September, where you you force these teams to play each other when they would never want to play each other, but you give them a check to do it, and then you put the playoff there at the end. Do it like basketball. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, and make, them, make them play. I mean, every it'll game. never happen because it's it's, and I don't know how it would necessarily work. But I really think if you want to do this, if you want to keep the bowl games and keep title sponsors and all this other garbage, I mean, obviously you would take away the, the festivities of going to some places, you know, wonderful as El Paso for a week as part of the Sun Bowl. <laughs> but I really do think that that way you would give television what it wants, which is compelling pre- pre-conference matchups, which none of these coaches want any part of, but you give them enough money with the athletic directors say, no, we're going to do this, and then you put the bowl ga- and then you put the playoffs and near the end, and you put, you know, you do it at the Rose Bowl, you give, give it the Sugar Bowl, all those things. Because I'm telling you, what we're seeing right now, it's going to be more of the same. It's going to be stadiums that are going to be half full, if that, and it's going to be TV ratings that are through the basement floor, which is what drove the BCS to adopt the four team playoff model. Yeah. You keep giving us this. I can't see anybody watching. No, no. I mean, some of the worst matchups you could possibly see. For one thing, I, I'm done with the seven, uh, the six wins qualifies you. I mean, it ought to be eight. It really ought to be eight. You know, when you play I agree, 12 games. I, I totally agree. I think, I think it is completely diluted what it means to win a bowl game, to, to be bowl eligible. But if you're the athletic director yeah, and you're, you're the head coach, Chances are about ninety percent that you've got a clause in your contract that if you become bowl eligible or win a bowl, you're going to make an additional fifty to one hundred plus thousand dollars for your annual salary. Sure, sure. So sure. why would you do anything to disrupt that money train, even though the ratings are atrocious? I mean, but that's what I'm talking about, though. I mean, you hear, you know, all you heard throughout all of this argument against having a playoff is that we want to protect and preserve the bowl relationship. Well, how are you preserving it when you put up matchups through the system like that Orange Bowl game where you're going to have 50% of the stadium? And the only reason that stadium is going to draw anything is because Florida State's in the game. I mean, there's not going to be anybody at that ball game otherwise. I tend to agree with you. I don't know Northern Illinois' enrollment. But I, I, I thought, well, if it's a big state school, maybe all of them, you know, kind of like when Northwestern went to the Rose Bowl or when TCU went to the Rose Bowl, the the um, the uniqueness of it drew every single alum alive down to South Florida. And I think, you know, and that's, and that's the other part of the bowl thing, that I look at all these different games and where they're located. You know, it's, it's so expensive now to, to travel and to do these things. I got to tell you, Brian. There's only about four or five games that, if I'm a Kansas alum, I have a TCU degree as well. But if my team is in one of those bowl games, 
Like the TCU was in the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl. I mean, <laughs> what the hell is that? I'm not getting on a plane and going to Phoenix to watch Michigan State TCU, even though no. that's a decent matchup, I think, I guess. I don't know. There's only about four or five of them that really have a genuine tourist attraction element, and that's New Orleans, Miami, San Diego, L.A. for sure. The Rose Bowl is sure. the best one. And the Cotton Bowl to a degree. Yeah. So I've named five. The other one for sure is the Pinstripe Bowl. But <laughs> putting a bowl game. No, I mean, I really, I think from a tourist standpoint, I, I do believe going to New York City is a great draw. Okay, that's, that's a, a good cool point. Trip. Yeah, good point. I mean, I'm just thinking of reasons to go. But other than that, I'm like, Jacksonville, Florida? Oh, really? Man. Tampa, yeah. Orlando, uh, you know, Glendale, Arizona? On and on and on. And in, in, uh, it, uh, the only way it's going to change is if nobody goes and nobody watches. Yeah. And I could see as bad as those ratings were and those attendance figures were for the BCS and all the bowl games last season, with this slate of crap, <laughs> I would have to assume it's even going to be worse this season. Makes these Cowboy games look pretty good, doesn't it? I know. Bring on the Bengals, baby. <laughs> and Jane Fonda. <laughs> Bring on the Bengals, and let's talk more about AM, PM yoga DVDs with the 70-plus-year-old icon Jane Fonda rather than any college football <laughs> games at this point. You have a great life, man. I'm telling really you, do. you have a great yeah. life. Like, yeah. Hey, Mac, thanks very much, man. It's great talking to you. Bye. Okay, Brian, thanks a lot. Have a great week. Good talking to you. Mac Engel, the author of the Big Mac blog on Fort Worth Star Telegram and DFWOT on Brian Houston Sports Radio Live on 99.3 Talk FM.